Well, welcome back to Mr. Foreman's workshop for the gearbox overhaul. We have here our housings, all as clean as I can get them, and boxes of parts. It all got very expensive very quickly, so this all had to be ordered in small, affordable packages over a very long period of time. I was worried about financially overreaching myself and, in consequence, having to relocate my residential address to a McDonald's trash can. However, we'll move on. Let me clear the table and we'll start by preparing the bell housing. I'm going to start by uh, bashing in some bearings, but it's a little bouncy up there, so we're down on the concrete. Quite like concrete, there's just something solid about it. Feels pretty good. I've got to order myself a new locker, but we'll use the old one and a little bit of Loctite. I'm going to add it all. This is all the uh, lay shaft retainers. The next course of action is to press in the primary pinion. Now the original previously I declared good to go, but on closer inspection we can see this nasty big gouge up on the nose of it, and down the bottom are some heavily chipped gears. So we wisely invested in a new one that come with a brand new fourth gear for the lay shaft, a mated pair. We have our Hobbit press. It's half the size, half the price, and I'm a sucker for a bargain. Let's get our stuff in there. Oh. Gotta find some level ground on this rather wonky floor. We're moving into more conventional methods. Pin goes in there. Got this old spring shackle. Probably use a little, little oil on that bearing, but we don't want to do that just yet. We do have our, uh, our locker. Can fit on there somehow. Should be some little slots for it, there they are. And then we have our lefty tighty righty loosey nut. Brand new. Okay, so we're just gonna do that up uh, finger tight. So there's a lot more we need to do with the bell housing, but that's all we're gonna do for now. So, to protect those bearings, I'm gonna chuck it in a trash bag and store it away until we are ready to proceed further. Down the bottom of the gearbox, we have to replace a race for the rear bearing of the lay shaft. And any operations down there are much more better with reverse gears propped up and out of the way. Sure we put it in the right way otherwise we'd be embarrassed. So 
So this housing slots into the back of the gearbox and allows the access of the main shaft into the transfer case. So there'll be a bearing on one side, seal on the other, and it'll be held in by two big circlips. Oh, have I, have I told you about my press? Stuff those circlip pliers, just use my fingers. Just down here, barely visible, is a tiny little dowel. And there, in the top of that casing, is a hole. And the dowel is going to live in that hole. And then in the back of the gearbox is a slot. Hmm? That's what the dowel does. It stops this thing from wanting to spin around in circles. So we have to line that up and insert it from the inside out. Okay, the bearing's gonna be on the, on the inside of the box. I'll stick that in there. Okay, so what I'm doing here is bashing up that housing quite a bit, so it's, it's lined up with the dowel. And I think just to push it through, you're going to need something softer. So that hammer technique you saw me deploying earlier on, don't do that. That's just vandalism. Save yourself pain, heartache and money. Finally got that circlip in, my pliers couldn't even open it wide enough to be able to get it to slot on, so we had to use some unconventional methods. We have here a retainer that holds our seals on the selector shafts that I'd like to install now, so I don't lose them later on. Then there's a second one that fits onto the top cover. We still do have a seal that we can put into that rear housing we just installed, but I'm concerned that it might get damaged. So I'm gonna hold off onto that until we're ready to put in the main shaft and the lay shaft and everything else back together. In the meantime, to protect the bearings and uh, just the general cleanliness of this unit, we're gonna bag it up and pack it away. See what happens when we're left unsupervised? I think it's important before we put all this back together that we have a discussion and get an understanding of how all this works. The primary pinion, it's a spinner. This thing's connected directly to the engine. So when the engine's running, it's spinning. And the only way to stop it, shut the engine down or depress the clutch and disengage it. Now the main shaft. On this, there are only two components that are splined into the shaft and are able to drive it. That is the synchro clutch and first gear. The other two just spin. The nose with a bearing on it butts up into the back of the primary pinion like such. And then, as we turn our primary pinion, we see the main shaft is not turning because it's a separate unit. Oh my, how are we gonna resolve this issue? Hello, lay shaft. Now the lay shaft lives beneath everybody else. And what I've called fourth gear before would more accurately be termed a constant gear. All four of these gears are splined to the lay shaft. So when the primary pinion is turning, the lay shaft is turning and all those gears are spinning. But do notice the reverse direction of the lay shaft to the primary pinion. Barring one exception, power comes from the engine to the primary pinion, down through the lay shaft and up to the main shaft via your selected gear ratio. If no gear is selected, the main shaft does not turn. As we do so, these gears are spinning 
But as you can see, I'm holding the shaft, it's not being driven. We are in neutral. Now let's start with first gear. Seen here in the neutral position. Now select the fork lives there. We depress the clutch, cutting off power to the system. And then we drive our first gear on the main shaft, linking it with first gear on the lay shaft. Now as we turn our primary pinion, the main shaft is driven in the first gear ratio, sending power out to the rest of the transmission. Notice the reverse flow from the lay shaft to the main shaft. The main shaft now turns in the same direction as the primary pinion. All right, let's go into second gear. We press the clutch, shift into neutral, and as there is no synchro between first and second, we're gonna double clutch. And then we drive our gear onto the secondary teeth of second gear, and now second gear is splined into first, no longer free spinning. So although it is still first gear driving the main shaft, it's doing so at the second gear ratio. So now shifting out of second gear drives our first gear cog back into the neutral position. Then as we move to select third gear, it engages our select fork that lives right there in the middle of the synchro clutch unit. And third gear drives back like such. And what's happened here is very similar to what happened before, is that third gear no longer free spins. It's splined into the synchro clutch unit that now drives the main shaft at the third gear ratio. So fourth gear is the exception to the rule in requiring the lay shaft's assistance. For as we slip into neutral and then punch it into fourth, the synchro clutch now splines directly to the back end of the primary pinion, bypassing the lay shaft altogether. There's a direct flow of power straight through from the engine, the main shaft, and out to the rest of the transmission and those tires smoking up the highway at 40 mile an hour. You are in fourth gear. So lastly, reverse gears. Regardless of what gear you're selected, you have to go through the neutral gate, bringing and cutting off power to the main shaft. Then as you punch into reverse gear, it has a dual cog system that the selector fork drives backward into position. One cog links onto the lay shaft's first gear. The other cog links onto the main shaft's first gear while it's in the neutral position, but splined to the main shaft. So it is that power is now distributed to the main shaft. But remember the inversions of the rotation sequentially. The primary pinion goes forward, the lay shaft goes backward. The reverse gears are driven forward, driving first gear on the main shaft backward. You are in reverse in the first gear ratio. Our lay shaft ready for reassembly. Now a lot's happened since we first took all this stuff apart and inspected it because over time we found a few more potential problems and even significant wear that we'd missed first time around. Now third gear on the main shaft we had to press out that seized bush so I felt it prudent to buy a new one of these. Pretty much everything is now going to be brand new except for first gear on the main shaft and reverse gear in the gearbox. Everything else brand new. A little bit of heat. I think we might have done it. Second gear is the next one to go on and that's held in place by this little split ring right there that originally came in one piece. But uh, just put that in a vise, give it a whack with a hammer and gently ground off the, the bits. So we line it up as it broke, place it into its little groove. Second gear slots on with a recess. snap into place. Hmm? Wonderful. Okay, now these gears have little collars on them and they face the front of the shaft, the one that's got the threads on. Next we have third gear and this one is going to be a little tight. This is our Dingo Croft one. There we go. 
Now these sleeves are machined to be the right size to eliminate any end float on the gears at all. So if there's anywhere on your sleeve, you're gonna have to replace it. And lastly, our constant gear with the long collar facing down towards the back of the shaft. We'll line that up. There we go. Now, if you're dealing with a, a later model series vehicle, like a Series 3, they've done away with all this, all this malarkey and it's just one set unit. It either works or it doesn't. We have here a selection of conical distance pieces that are gonna fit on the nose of the lay shaft and they're gonna dictate how the lay shaft sits in the gearbox when it's sandwiched between the back of the gearbox and the bell housing. So if it's too thick, then the shaft is gonna be too tight with a lot of preload on the bearings, and that's not good. And if the distance piece is too thin, you're gonna have backwards and forwards slop, which you want absolutely none of. So we need to find the right measurements of this thing here to find that happy medium between too much and too little. So we're gonna to have to test fit this into the gearbox and install the bell housing. All right, using our transfer case as a stand, we'll load in our thing. Okay. And we'll just secure it with one bolt, should be good. Just so, just to hold it in there. Now we're gonna use our little socket trick to put reverse gears up and out of the way. And now I think we're ready to install the lay shaft with the bearing first that I have pre-lubricated that we're gonna pop on the back. Cause I don't wanna run them dry. Oh, what's going on there? Oh, well we had some technical difficulties. The original bearing just, just dropped off the original lay shaft. This one, this one I had to press it on. Anyway, we're gonna lubricate inside here the race now lubrication needs a word because if left to my own devices i would be using the latest and greatest and most bestest gear oil for the transfer box and the gearbox however the new ones have additives in them that react badly to bronze pieces like the bushes and thrust washers and other components you'll find inside these they corrode them so it's quite important that you don't use the latest and greatest and bestest that you use GL4 gear oils. And I'm using Starlube 85 by, by 90 weight. And so that's a GL4, not the GL5s. So once we have our lubrication in there, it's time to gently lower in our lay shaft, not drop it. Now, as for our distance piece, we're gonna be using the one that has the same measurements as the original with our thin washer. So we've got a new one, same measurements, pop it on. And then I bought myself a second gasket just in case as a possible sacrificial one. And you may say why. And I'm thinking we're talking about distances. So the gasket has a thickness and that could affect what we're seeing here so I feel that it's a good idea that we install it. So that's way too tight. It's unacceptable. We're going to take it apart again Keep the distance piece we have, remove the washer. Turn smooth, and oh dear, that is the sound of slop. That's not good. Okay, we'll go to our next plan. We're gonna try the smaller distance piece with a washer. There 
we go. Oh, that, that's it. We got our combination. <laughs> Finally, a smooth turn and no slop. Oh, that's the sound of no slop. There is no sound. It's time to reassemble the main shaft, which is gonna be a lot more complicated than what the book might suggest, namely because of poor quality parts. Well, pushing that aside, the most complex section of the main shaft is gonna be second and third gears. And they live between the shoulder of these splines and this groove where the split ring lives. Now these two gears spinning on their bronze bush have a minimal end float between 0 0.004 and 0 0.007 of an inch. There needs to be some there, I believe, for oil to circulate. It's, it's very important. And this end float, at least, is controlled somewhat by two thrust washers that sandwich the two gears into each other. Moving on, examining these mysterious little holes that live on the main shaft. One is for the pin, and the other is for the peg. The pin will go in first. On the final installation, we're gonna lock tight these guys into place. Encourage them not to fall out. So, what he does is he stops the thrust washer from spinning. So this thrust washer for second gear, you can see it has a shiny back that lives up against the shoulder. Four notches on the front that presses up against the gear, two little notches on the inside and they slot over top of our pin, or at least one of them does. And this is how the thrust washer is just supposed to slide on. There shouldn't be any fighting or battling. And there you go, over top of the pin, doesn't spin. Next, we have a bronze bush. And the operator's manual says, do not install the peg just yet. You'll see that we have a notch in the bush and that fits over top of our peg and that stops the bush from spinning. All right, but don't be deceived. You're going to see more trouble ahead. So as we push our bush up against the thrust washer, you can see that the groove cut in there is not deep enough. There was no point procrastinating, we might as well just start. And I'm going to select some thrust washers at random because if you have a look at the original, that's not what a thrust washer is supposed to look like. So we've got nothing to go on from that point. That's just worn down to the stumps. I'm going to start off with the one, 0.127 for second gear. Now I'm going to put in my peg because I want to make sure that the bush isn't just going to get hung up. And we'll put on our bush. So we're starting off without the gears. And then our second half of the bush. Oh. And then I'm going to select the point one, two, three, the slender one. And just eyeballing that up, it looks pretty close. When we get in the snap ring, we'll see what tolerances we have. Now to check the end float of our sleeve by itself with our selection of thrust washers that we've chosen. Now the end float is accessible already. I'm going to start off with a 0 0.015 feeler gauge and it slots in. Okay, so that's nearly twice the end float already. I'm going to go up to a 0 0.0017. That's a tight fit, but I think I could go up one more as well, but we'll call it quits there. Okay, so let's say we need to get rid of 0 0.017 of an inch. Now, the fattest thrust washers we have is a 0.135 for second gear, a 0.13 for third gear. So when I add those on to the ones that we have, we have a addition of 0 0.007 and 0 0.008, bringing us to a total of 0 zero one five if you're following all that garbage all right so the theory is is our two fattest thrust washers should bring us within tolerance of the end float for the sleeve 127 back is that chunky fat boy Hang on there Hang on our sleeve we take the 130 back and we put on the 128 so we're going to try with the 128 it just i don't know just a gut feeling. I know the calculations were done, but 
We'll see. Okay, so we've got our point zero zero two. Just slides in. So we're right down on the lower end of our tolerance, and I'm very happy with that. Next, we have to take off that snap ring again because we just love doing it. Put on our gears, and then we check the end float on them, which is between 0 0.004 and 0 0.007 of an inch. This is, once again, just a test. And even if it passes the test, we're going to have to disassemble it to reassemble it and make sure everything's spotless and clean. And then we have to glue in our pins and pegs. So we're going to start off with our uh, thrust washer that we find works, so 0.135. And we want to put in our peg. And then we're going to slot on second gear. Third gear. Oh, come on. 0.128 thrust washer in there. Now we're going to install our snap ring and hope, hope that everything's within tolerance. Fingers crossed. Now to check our end float. I can tell straight away, second gear has a smooth turn and it's fairly solid. And third gear just has that little bit of movement. So we'll start off on the lowest end of the tolerance for second gear. And yeah, 0.004, right on the very lowest end. Now the other guy will start off at 0 0.008, which is outside tolerance. No, down to 0 0.007, and that's what it is. So I would like everything to be on the lower end of the tolerances. So second gear is good, but third gear is a little sloppy as far as I'm concerned. So what we're gonna do is take it apart again. And then we're gonna need a flat bit of glass and then some emery cloth. We're gonna take our respective bush for the third gear side and give it a rub. It's a soft metal, we don't wanna take off much, it's gonna happen fast, be ready. <laughs> oh, I tell you, we got lucky. We got lucky on that one. One more second, I reckon, Robin would have been buying a new bush, because we are 0 .004 on the dot. We've taken out all that extra slop, and now we have perfection. Perfection, that's what we have. So we're gonna take this apart again, because everything needs a good clean up, the pins and the peg needs to be installed, and then a good oiling, and then we're ready. We're ready to press this main shaft into the box.